We turn now to James chapter 4, verses 13 to 17. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we shall go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business, make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a wafer that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do, or the good thing to do, and does not do it, to him it is sin. We have to see this passage also in its context. James has been speaking about the necessity of humility, of a humble approach to God. And we've seen that the theme of James' letter is that faith without work is dead. If faith is genuine, it will bring forth works of obedience, works that glorify God. And he has many things that he speaks about as the evidence of genuine faith, which we have looked at in the earlier chapters. And in the latter half of chapter 4, beginning with verse 6, he's speaking about humility. It's one of the marks of genuine faith. If your faith is genuine, you will be humble, genuinely humble in your heart before God. Where there is pride, there is no faith. Now, this can be seen very clearly from that very well-known quotation, which is quoted three times in the New Testament. Romans 1.17 The just, or the righteous man, shall live by faith. Now, when you look at the Old Testament quotation from which this verse is taken, it's in the book of Habakkuk, chapter 2, and verse 4, where it reads like this, As for the proud one, that is the one whose soul is lifted up in him, his soul is not right within him, but in contrast, the righteous will live by his faith. So notice, in Habakkuk 2, verse 4, the contrast is between one who lives by faith and one who is proud. Pride is, in a sense, the opposite of faith. Unbelief stems from pride. That is the contrast drawn in Habakkuk 2, verse 4. There is pride on one hand, and there is living by faith on the other hand, and the two cannot go together. If our soul is lifted up within us, then we are proud, and then we cannot live by faith. Genuine faith brings humility. Because genuine faith brings a man down on his face before God, acknowledging his impotence, his helplessness, and his utter dependence upon God. Then he cannot think of himself more highly in relation to other people. This is why Paul could say, we walk by faith, not by sight. But he could also say, concerning his own self in Ephesians 3, 8, that he was less than the least of all the saints. Now, he was not saying that just to appear humble. He genuinely believed that he was less than the least of all the saints because he had a proper estimate of himself in relation to God. He knew that everything he received, he received from God. Therefore, he walked by faith. So humility is one of the marks of genuine faith. And where there is a humble attitude, there will be a freedom from judging others and speaking against others, as James says in James 4, 11 and 12. And also in our relationship with God and in, our, in relation to the plans we make for the future, etc. There will be a humble spirit of freedom from self-confidence. And that's what James is hitting at in verses 13 to 16 of James 4. He says, you people are too arrogant, verse 16. You boast in your arrogance or in your self-confidence. You think that you can plan what you want and do what you want. And you say today or tomorrow, verse 13, we'll go and live in such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit and make plans for the future without any relation to the will of God, without considering God's will or without thinking of uh, whether God is going to be involved in it at all and what God's plans for your life are. And he says, you don't know what your life is like tomorrow. James 4.14. He says, your life is just like a vapor. 
You know the steam that escapes when water is boiling? You see it for a moment, and the next moment it's gone. How brief it is. And he says, your life is just like that. Not only your life, James 4.14, you yourself are just a vapor that appears for a little while in this world and then vanishes away. You leave this world to go to the God who created you to whom you have to give an account of your whole life. So how can you make plans without reference to God, he says. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. James 4.15 You see, he's not saying that we shouldn't make any plans for the future. No. But what he's saying is in any plan that you make for the future, there must be a humble dependence upon God. This is the essential thing. We are to make plans by all means. But we are to make them in the presence of the Lord knowing that God's will is the fundamental thing in all these plans that we make. And that God may decide that I finished my life course on earth and then my plans are all broken and I'm quite willing to submit to that. That is what James is emphasizing here. Not that you shouldn't make plans, but that you ought to say, if the Lord wills, if that is God's will for my life. You remember when Jesus taught us to pray, he said, pray like this, our Father who art in heaven. And one of the things he said was, thy will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. And then the next request is, give us this day our daily bread. Why do we ask for our daily bread? It's in relation to the previous prayer. Give us this day our daily bread, so that we might have strength to do your will on earth, as it is done in heaven. We have no right to ask for our daily bread for any other reason. The world is full of people who ask and take their daily bread and live for themselves. But we are to be, as James says in James 1, a first fruit among his creatures. God has called us, James 1.18, to be a peculiar people to be a demonstration to the rest of the world of a new creation. Therefore, we don't live, make our own plans to, for ourselves, but we submit to the will of God. And it's not just a question of saying with our lips as a matter of ritual, God willing, I'll do this. For if it comes merely from our lips and does not come from our heart, it has no value. But James is obviously referring to that which comes from our heart, a humble dependence on the fact that I cannot do anything apart from God's enabling and God willing it. Otherwise, this whole thing is going to become a fiasco. The whole thing is going to fail. And therefore, when we make plans, even for tomorrow, to go to a place, or to do anything, concerning our profession, it speaks about engaging in business. Nothing wrong in engaging in business. Provided we submit that business to the will of God, and say, Lord, everything is submitted to your will. Now, this is the attitude of a humble person, a person who does not submit to the will of God in every aspect of his life, in every area of his life, is proud, he's self-sufficient, and he does not have faith. His soul is lifted up in him. Now, in conclusion, James 4, 17. Therefore, he says, to the one who knows the right thing to do, and what is the right thing to do? The right thing to do is to humble ourselves, verse 10, in the presence of God, so that we don't judge one another, we don't speak against one another, we submit our plans to the will of God, and we humble ourselves and have small thoughts concerning ourselves in every area. One who knows the right thing to do and does not do it. He does not humble himself like this. To him it is sin. He's living in sin. No matter how active he may be in Christian work or in Bible reading or anything, if we know that the right thing to do is to humble ourselves and we don't do it, then we are living in sin. And this is the condition with many, that God desires to save us from that condition.